Um, I think transparency uh, of company ownership really is the bedrock really of our, of our societies. Um, we need to be able to know who owns companies and who makes money uh, within our countries. We need to be able to understand how money is flowing around our financial system. Um, and we need to do that for a whole number of reasons. We need to do that so we can ensure that we are collecting revenue properly, uh, that we are tackling corruption, uh, that we are tackling uh, really pernicious, pernicious issues uh, like money laundering. Um, but I think another reason that we need to ensure that we have transparency around company ownership uh, is that it's good for business. Uh, it ensures that people see the UK as an open and transparent country where they can understand corporate governance structures, they can feel confident knowing that who they're working with uh, is in fact the people they think they're working with uh, and that they can come to the UK and know that information about corporate ownership is freely available so that they can make good informed decisions about who to trade with. I think what we understand really clearly is that tackling corruption is a transnational issue. It doesn't stop at the EU borders, uh, it affects us all. We have to work together as a global community to ensure that we are implementing domestic reforms which support each other um, to tackle some of these issues domestically because we are talking about public money wherever it is um, and citizens of all countries in the world deserve, I think, to, uh, to uh, receive the revenues that they're due uh, and to ensure that companies that operate within their jurisdiction, jurisdictions are as open and transparent as possible. I think, you know, we're keen to emphasise that the, the arguments for beneficial ownership transparency um, don't stop at tackling corruption. Um, the more positive arguments, I suppose, are, are much more to do with creating business environments where companies and individuals from around the world feel confident about coming to a jurisdiction and, and investing. Um, and I think that's an argument that we should be making as strongly as we do around arguments for beneficial ownership, transparency to tackle corruption. So the UK, um, obviously for many years, within all of the kind of multilateral initiatives that have been moving us uh, towards transparent, open public registers, we've really been uh, at the forefront of those international negotiations for many years. Uh, in 2013, though, our former Prime Minister David Cameron uh, really took beneficial ownership and particularly open registers of beneficial ownership uh, and made it a political priority for him. Uh, so we were delighted to announce at the 2013 Global OGP Summit in London that we would be creating a public register of persons of significant control, our beneficial ownership register. Um, and we passed legislation uh, after that and the first wave of data uh, about beneficial ownership, our persons of significant control register, uh, was released in the middle of last year. Um, what we see, I think, and, and what we have found um, interesting but perhaps not surprising is the degree of compliance. 98% of entities have reported and reported accurately, we think, uh, and they have done that without too much uh, concern, too much complaint. Um, and I think what that's shown in the UK is that we've been able to introduce these transparency measures. Um, we've done it well. We have kept people informed about the changes that are coming. Uh, we've put in place a system that's able to collect that data uh, in an effective way that doesn't place too great a burden on organisations. Um, so people who've been able to give us that data and do it well, we have seen very little friction, if you like, in terms of collecting that data. So for us, I think that's the, the biggest early win. Um, it's only a year old. I think we have a, a, a lot further to go in terms of gathering historic data and beginning to understand how we can use uh, this information. I know colleagues in uh, kind of law enforcement inside of the UK government and civil society have spent time with this data and are beginning to understand how it can support them in their investigations. Um, I think if we were having this conversation maybe another year on, we'd probably have a little more um, evidence and understanding of the kind of impact that this has had. Um, I think one of the things I'm really excited about though is the kind of collaboration that's happening between civil society and government in terms of how we improve this data set. Um, of course, this is very much at the heart of OGP. We, it is an organisation and partnership designed to help government and civil society to work together, not just to make ambitious commitments, but also to help implement them. Um, I was really pleased to see um, work by by Global Witness uh, last year. Uh, we come together for a weekend um, to, to understand how uh, the data 
was, was flowing, uh, the kind of quality of data that we were getting, and spend some time with data scientists uh, beginning to kind of create some tools for analysis, um, but also to kind of look at where the register could be improved. And following that kind of weekend of kind of deep investigation, uh, we were able to put together some recommendations for some, from simple, some, for some simple amendments that we could put to Companies House, who are our organisation that holds company registration in the UK, to improve the register. How we could make some relatively simple uh, technical changes to improve the quality of data. And for me, that's part of this story is about ensuring that the more data we open, the more opportunities there are for any part of society to come together with, with government to collaborate. So I think um, so far, I think there's, there's been a great deal of use of the register. We have many millions uh, of, of hits on it per month. And uh, on top of that, I think it's really fostered a new way of working with civil society to make the best use of this data that we possibly can. I think as we go forward, the challenge really is to make, make sure that we maintain a quality register, that we ensure that the data is as usable as possible. Uh, we have some things, I think, uh, in the UK and globally that we need to address around how we create and publish open data around company registration. Uh, issues such as having uh, non-proprietary and unique identifiers so that we can quickly and accurately uh, identify corporate entities, not just in the beneficial ownership data, uh, but also in other open data releases, particularly around public procurement. Um, so I think a really big challenge is understanding how we can make sure the open data that we produce around ownership, public contracting and other relevant data sets is truly interoperable. So that is about ensuring we have really good unique identifiers to link together organisations, uh, but also focus long term on ensuring that the quality is good and that we continue to work with those people who are using the data to make sure that it's really working for them. I think standard setting uh, around data is incredibly important. I think what I would say is though that we don't necessarily need to rush towards single standards for everything, as long as um, those people creating new standards have an eye towards interoperability and we solve some of those key issues around non-proprietary unique identifiers, there are no reason why new standards can't emerge and challenge and innovate the others that exist, uh, as long as they're able to work together with existing data. So I think this is less about sort of uh, rushing towards the creation of a single standard per se, but is more about ensuring that we focus on interoperability. Um, creating standards, I think, is a, is a sort of evolving space at all times. There's never a fixed points to which I think we are working. And that's a good thing because uh, as, as things change, as data changes, uh, as new policy challenges emerge, standards will have to evolve with them. Um, so I think it's something that we in the UK have certainly been investing a lot of time in. Uh, we've been pleased over the last uh, few months to support the creation uh, of the open ownership register uh, that, that has been launched, which has now got beneficial ownership data from ourselves and Ukraine and Slovakia and I think others. Um, so I think it's projects like that that are going to support the community of people around the world who are working towards data standards for beneficial ownership as we have done in other areas around say open contracting. So I'm really excited about what the future holds for beneficial ownership data. I think we're just beginning to scratch the surface. Uh, and I think if we were to come back and sit here in five years time, um, I think we'd be in a really exciting space where we would have uh, much more data from many countries around the world in open formats uh, that was linked together using non-proprietary unique identifiers. And that was really achieving benefit, not just for domestic law enforcement, but for civil society and citizens everywhere. I think OGP's role um, and can, should continue to be its role in all of this is ensuring that there is space for government and civil society to come together, both domestically and internationally, to share how we're implementing these kinds of reforms. Um, today's event here in Bratislava, I think, is a wonderful example of many governments, many different civil society groups from around the world coming together to really get into the detail of these reforms, how they're implemented, the opportunities and the challenges. OGP's role should be to continue to bring those people to the table and provide space for that to continue to happen.